seconds away. That's how precise we are today on this Wednesday afternoon. All right. Hey, Bridget. Yes. You you usually have palm trees in the back of you. You got a you got a plain blue wall today. Yeah, it does have an RTA logo in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're ready to go. It is two o'clock on Wednesday. I would like to call the board and budget and finance committee meeting to order. Um, thank you for joining the board budget and finance committee meeting Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. And uh, before we begin, you all know the rules. Try to be in a quiet place. Um, I know Linda's got a parrot in the background, so we'll be, uh, we'll be looking out for that and can't wait to hear that. But please be in a quiet place. Make sure you mute your device until called upon. Um, and Joan, would you please read the special notice? On March 4, 2020, Governor Newsom proclaimed a state of emergency in California as a result of the threat of COVID-19. Public gatherings are to be limited. Further, on March 18, 2020, Governor Newsom temporarily suspended the Brown Act requirements pertaining to telephonic conferencing of local government meetings and the requirement to have at least one physical location available to the public for purposes of attending the meeting. As such, RTA has opted to conduct the May 5, 2021 Budget and Finance Committee meeting via teleconference. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, Self-introductions for today's meeting, we'll take roll call. Claire, will you please take the roll call? Jeremy Smith, City Here. of Canyon Lake. Here. Ray Santos, City of Beaumont. Here. Linda Molina, City of Cala Mesa. Here. Art Welch, representing County of Riverside District 5. Here. Linda Krupa, City of Hemet. Timothy J. Sheridan, City of Lake Elsinore. Here. Ted Hoffman, City of Norco. Here. Bridget Moore, City of Wildemar. Here. And Andrea Mars, representing County of Riverside, District 3. Here. And Chair, you have a quorum. Members, please remember to remit your device. Thank you so much. Would you please take attendance of RTA staff as well? Yes, thank you, Chair. Larry Rubio. Here. Charlie Ramirez. Here. Tom Franklin. Here. Natalie Zaragoza. Here. Rick Majors. Here. Kristen Warsinski. Here. Rick Kazarowski. Here. Jim Neepkins. Here. Melissa Blankenship. Here. Stephanie Searles. Here. Adam Chavez. Here. Senia Felix. Here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. All right, moving right along. Um, next is item number three, which is public comments. Non-agenda items. Joan, please read the direction for public comments. Yes. Members of the public may address the board regarding any item within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. However, no action may be taken on off-agenda items unless authorized by law. 
Comments shall be limited to matters not listed on the agenda. Members of the public may comment on any matter listed on the agenda at the time that the board considers that matter. Each person's presentation is limited to a maximum of three minutes. Has the clerk received any requests in writing? No, Chair Smith, I have not. Perfect. All right, if there are anyone on the line that would like to make a comment on items not listed on the agenda, please do so now. All right, hearing none, the public comment portion for items not listed on the agenda is now closed. Hearing no more, the public comments portion for the item not listed on the agenda is now closed as well. Okay, moving along. Uh, next is item number four, which is approval of the minutes for April 7th, 2021 Budget and Finance Committee meeting. Does anyone have any comments on the minutes? Can I get a motion to approve? Cala Mesa moves. Second. Bowman. Perfect. I got a Cala Mesa on the first and I got a Bowman on the second. Um, are there any no's? Any abstentions? The motion's passed. Perfect. All right, next is item five, which is cash flow projections. Charlie, you are up, my friend. Thank you, Chair Smith, members of the committee. My name is Charlie Ramirez, Chief Financial Officer for the agency. You have before you on page eight, the agency's actual cash performance through late April, followed by a projection of weekly cash activity through June of this year. This is a period that covers the remainder of fiscal year 2021. I'm happy to report there are no anticipated cash flow issues expected during this reporting period. And that completes my presentation. Perfect. Are there any questions from the committee members? Any questions from the public? This is a receive and file. So we're moving right along. Item number six, quarterly investment reports. Charlie, this is yours again. Thank you, Chair. Page 10 displays the agency's investment performance for the quarter ending March 31st, 2021. There was a slight loss on investments in this quarter due to a continued challenging interest rate environment. However, investment income year to date remains positive at $115,000. My expectation is that we will finish the year below budget on this line item. However, the amounts involved are small enough that it will not affect agency operations or cash flow. We will continue to monitor the investment vehicles to ensure that they properly align with agency objectives. And that concludes my presentation. Perfect. For those of you that are following, that was item six, quarterly investment reports. Um, any questions from committee members on it? All right. Any questions from the public? Again, this is a receive and file. All right, moving right along. Item seven, you are a popular man, Charlie. Uh, quarterly <laughs> natural gas, um, this is you, status report. Thank you. The agency's board approved investment policy outlines the criteria for procuring natural gas to power the 40 foot bus fleet. Prior to 2013, the agency procured its natural gas requirements from the Southern California Gas Company. Starting in 2013, the agency began purchasing its natural gas from a third party, GHI LLC. Not only does GHI provide the natural gas commodity at a discount from the indexed SoCal gas price, they also provide revenue stemming from the sale of RINs and LCFS credits. RINs and LCFS are the federal and state programs, respectively, that provide marketable credits for the use of natural gas as an alternative fuel source. Attached to the staff report are four graphs depicting key financial data for the agency's natural gas program for the quarter ending March 31. To summarize those results, the agency experienced cost savings of $23,000, earned combined revenue from RINs and LCFS of $403,000, and earned an additional $229,000 from federal excise tax credits. Uh, when you take the cost to purchase the gas and you roll in the revenue that we earned for using natural gas, uh, the agency achieved a net cost of a negative 37 cents per therm. That means the agency was actually paid to fuel its buses with natural gas, which is quite amazing. And that completes my presentation. Perfect. Uh, are there any questions from committee members on that? None? All right. Any questions from the public? Again, this is um, receive and file. 
Charlie, if you need to take water or take a take a break, I mean, this is your next, my friend. Item number eight is yours as well. This is the request to hold a public hearing on the fiscal year 2021-2022 operation budget, capital budget uh, 2022-24 as well, short range transit plan, SRTP, and adopt the FY22 budget, um, SRTP. A lot of acronyms there. Charlie, take it away. Thank you. I'm good to go. I just want to make sure you guys can all see the uh, screen. Yep. I'm good on this end. All right. Great. Um, yes. Once again, I am Charlie Ramirez, Chief Financial Officer, uh, and I'm here to present to you the proposed FY22 operating and capital budget and the 22 through 24 short range transit plan or SRTP. Uh, so the budget doesn't really get created in a vacuum. It's really here to support our mission and our strategy. Uh, which is to provide safe, reliable, and cost-effective transportation. That's who we are and that's what we do. Uh, to look at those a little closer, we want to provide safe transportation for our customers. Uh, safe has really never meant as much as it does now. Uh, we want to provide efficient service that maximizes the use of our resources. Uh, we want to provide excellent customer service. That's really at the core of what we do. We're here to serve and we want to do it with a smile. Uh, as usual, we want to be responsible with taxpayer dollars. and We want to make sure to comply with all laws and regulations. So the service profile, this is what really drives the numbers in the budget. Uh, when we look at fixed route revenue service, uh, we are going to continue with Sunday level service seven days a week. Uh, I know many are eager for us to come out of that, but we're just not there yet. We're not seeing the demand. Uh, we're going to play things conservatively. Uh, we will continue to offer certain select commuter link routes, as we know uh, these are dependent upon. Uh, you may remember that Transportation Management and Design, or TMD, uh, presented their recommendations to reduce service and become more efficient. Uh, that was approved by the board. Uh, many of those suspensions of routes and route segments are set to take effect here in the next few days in May, uh, with the rest sprinkled throughout FY22. As an offshoot of some of those suspensions, we do want to introduce a circulator and micro transit in the Hemet San Jacinto area. This will help serve some of the riders affected by those suspensions. Uh, on the micro transit front, uh, we are currently developing a plan. And uh, whenever we are ready, we will bring that before the board for their recommendation uh, before we do anything on that front. Uh, we do intend to increase frequencies, not system wide, but on certain select routes. We want to be a little bit more strategic. We're going to select the routes that we think need to be increased. Uh, we want to reintroduce two flagship routes that existed and were suspended during the pandemic, the Crest Cruiser and Temecula Trolley. Uh, in terms of dial -a ride uh, we will continue to offer the same coverage pre-COVID. Uh, we want to make sure that we are ready to serve our senior and disabled riders. Uh, we will continue DAR Plus, which makes this service uh, even more accessible by expanding the range. Uh, and we do anticipate that as the pandemic begins to subside, that more of these riders will come back to us in FY22. So what does that mean for ridership? Uh, System-wide, when you compare March to March, we're down 64%. Uh, if that's not stark enough, remember that does include comparing a uh, pandemic to partial pandemic numbers. Uh, when you look individually at some of the months pre and post pandemic, that number gets closer to 70%. Uh, so it has been significant indeed. But is there a cause for optimism? As we've seen decreasing COVID rates throughout the county, up and down the state, uh, as we progress through the tiers, uh, many schools uh, rushing to finish this school year off. So we have the expectation in the fall of 2021, schools will be back in session and of particular note to RTA, the colleges and universities. Uh, opening businesses, restaurants, entertainment venues. Uh, obviously this is great for our personal life, but also bodes well for RTA ridership. Uh, again, increases in vaccinations and availability across the county. Uh, we are holding a clinic here in a week or two, uh, so we hope that that uh, march continues. Uh, as such, we are predicting a hearty growth of 26% in ridership, uh, so that is good news. We do think that this recovery begins to get unway underway. Uh, however, keep in mind that the ridership will still be well below pre-COVID levels. Uh, we do think that we will get back to where we were uh, but we do not think it's going to happen in one year. It's going to take some time. Uh, so let's let's take a look at the numbers. Where are we at? Uh, the operating budget is coming in just below 85.7 million. That's a 4% or $3 million increase from last year's budget. Uh, for those of you that are fans of the Consumer Price Index or the CPI, 
Uh, the greater Riverside area for the last 12 months showed a growth of a positive 3.6%. Uh, so the 4% is basically in line with that. Uh, diving into some of the elements, uh, services were up. This was primarily driven by security. Uh, we are entering into a new contract with new rates. Uh, we, we continue to have a uh, high amount of security out on the streets as we do believe that safety is uh, very important and a core value. Uh, materials and supplies are up. This was driven by fuel and parts. Uh, the bus fleet continues to age, uh, making the need for fuel and parts even greater. Uh, the good news when we get to capital in a moment, uh, we do think we will get an infusion of new buses here in the next couple of years. Uh, we think the time is right to get back out and re-engage our customers. Uh, we want to have some promotions and some advertising that really gets them back on board. Uh, we want to reinstitute a wage increase. If you remember at the end of FY20 and all throughout FY21, there was an administrative wage freeze. Uh, we are looking to get this going back retroactive to April 15th, uh, which marked the one year anniversary of that freeze. Uh, even with that said, overall wages and benefits for all employees are flat. Uh, what we really saw was that cost increases were offset by staff attrition, which we'll look at in a second. One of the single largest drivers of this year's budget was insurance expense. Uh, the state of California and public transit continue to be tough markets uh, to gain insurance. Uh, so taking a look at the proposed staffing level for FY22, we start with FY21, which was budgeted at 509 employees. Uh, we wanna do some ads. We brought scheduling service in-house. We're just about ready to take off with that full bore. We wanna bring a scheduling analyst in to help with that. Uh, we want to bring in a maintenance supervisor. We want to ensure that maintenance is properly supported and has the correct amount of supervision. We also want to add another supervisor slash trainer. Uh, this position will really be geared at developing training programs and curriculum aimed at preparing our mechanics uh, for emerging technologies on the horizon, such as the hydrogen bus and fueling stations. Uh, and then we want to add a community relations coordinator. We want to get someone out in the community listening to our potential customers, our current writers, and stimulate ridership. And that's a total of four. So we're asking for a total of four added positions to the budget. And now let's look at some of the reductions. Uh, currently, there are 36 coach operator positions vacant. Uh, given this, the current service level, we do not plan to fill these positions. Uh, in line with that reduction and the reduction of service, we are going to leave open two operations supervisor positions and not fill those in FY22. Uh, the government affairs manager, uh, this position became vacant during FY21. Uh, the duties are being absorbed by the chief marketing officer at the moment. Similarly, the ADA clerk uh, position became vacant and this will not be filled. Duties will be absorbed by current staff. Uh, HR specialist, we have one on staff now and we, we believe in that role and HR as a whole can absorb these duties. Uh, contracts manager, there was a retirement in this department uh, some staff shuffling, and we believe that this position does not need to be filled and will, will be handled uh, by current existing purchasing staff. Uh, same thing on the finance side, we did have a retirement and some shuffling of staff. Uh, the accounting manager position is expected to become open due to a potential promotion that you'll see in a second. Um, and we do not think that we need to fill this role. But we have a grants analyst on staff who we believe can handle all the financial slash grant uh, duties that are out there. So we're not going to fill this role. Uh, likewise, revenue account coordinator, this position became open and is currently being absorbed by finance staff. Uh, the customer information center was redeployed and reorganized a year ago due to COVID. Um, as such, we are going to reduce four part-time CICs headcount. So that's a reduction total of 49. So when you take the FY21 budget of 509, you add in four and you deduct 49 that gets us to a proposed staffing level of 464 employees. Uh, for those counting, that's just shy of a 10% reduction. So if we look at modifications, uh, we wanna reclass the budget administrator to the financial administrator. This is more about expanding the role from not just the budget, but to other financial avenues. Uh, we wanna promote the planning and programming specialist to a grants manager. This is really in line with the increased complexities of grants as we see it today especially with the zero emission bus on the horizon. Uh, and we also wanna promote our accounting manager. Uh, this will better align the duties of the department given that we are now uh, have a smaller footprint. And that's total modifications, there's three. Uh, in terms of salary ranges, 
Uh, we want to increase the salary range for the maintenance supervisor and maintenance manager positions. Uh, we took a look at salary structure in maintenance, and it was determined that in certain shifts, a mechanic could earn more than their superiors. Uh, so we didn't want that to be the case. So as such, we are going to expand the maintenance supervisor range and accordingly the maintenance manager range, who is their supervisor. Um, these positions have historically been very difficult to fill. Uh, we wanna ensure that we remain competitive. Uh, the marketplace is changing and we wanna make sure we get the best. So quickly looking at the operating budget from a major function standpoint, uh, I believe as it should be operations and maintenance accounting for 75% of the business uh, with the support functions really marking out the last 25%. Uh, when you look at some of those numbers year over year, a couple of numbers jump out. Maintenance, as mentioned, the increased fuel and parts uh, also some additional supervision. Uh, the administration, a huge growth, uh, but I can tell you, as mentioned, almost all of this was fueled by increased insurance and security. On the cost element side, uh, about half of what we do, salaries and benefits, that makes sense. We are a service organization fueled by staffing. Uh, purchase transportation at 26, that's basically an extension of operations and maintenance. Uh, services and supplies at five apiece, other expenses rounding it out at 11, that's your uh, advertising, your software, your security, your insurance. Well, actually security would be under services, apologize. Um, looking year over year, as I mentioned, salaries and benefits about flat. Uh, purchase transportation up slightly due to increased demand, but not significant. Uh, services, as mentioned, increased security. Uh, supplies, parts and fuel, a uh, big number of other expenses. Again, insurance, big jump. In terms of fare box recovery ratio, we do expect a better infusion of fare and measure A and some other dollars. Uh, this is going to make us come much closer to our target than we did in FY21. However, we do anticipate continuing to fall short. Uh, if you remember in FY21, there was an exemption for fare box recovery. Uh, we do expect in the governor's budget for there to be an exemption for FY22 and possibly beyond, uh, but more to come on that. As we jump over to the capital side, uh, the capital budget is coming in at about 20.7 million. It's a big number, but there are some big ticket items in there. Uh, we are putting aside additional funding to purchase 70 new CNG buses. Uh, if you remember in the board approved zero emission bus rollout plan, uh, this was called for. Uh, really what it's about is extending the CNG technology, allowing the hydrogen market to mature and some of those costs to come down. Uh, in March, the board approved reprogramming Prop 1B fund funds from the central ops facility to this purchase. Uh, in this budget, we look to officially do that. Uh, the good news is with these first two items, the bus purchase is now fully funded and we can move forward with a procurement on that. Uh, we also did receive some additional funding already for the Vine Street Mobility Hub that we look to officially program. Uh, you all know that is a very important project. Uh, and we also wanna put money aside for some new technology fare boxes. Uh, we have not replaced those in some cases 10 to 20 years. Uh, as we all know, technology moves pretty quickly and we wanna take a look at what's out there and we believe that this will help the customer experience and on-time performance. Uh, we also set aside as we always do for maintenance, tires, associated transit improvements out on the street. Uh, we wanna make sure we keep our image in tip top shape. Uh, lastly, we program a sustainability study. This is really gonna look at our ability uh, to serve the community at different levels. Uh, if the last year has taught us anything is that we need to be prepared uh, to shift gears at a moment's notice. Uh, the good news is the FY22 budgets are fully funded on the operating and capital side, uh, no deficit spending. Uh, of particular note on the federal operating assistance, we did get an infusion of about $29 million in the American Rescue Plan Act funds or ARPA funds. That was the latest round of COVID stimulus. Uh, so there is a healthy amount of those dollars in this budget. So what is the recommendation? Uh, to recommend this item to the full board of directors for their consideration as follows. Hold a public hearing on the FY22 operating budget, FY22 capital budget, and the FY22 through FY24 SRTP. Adopt the FY22 budgets and the FY22 through 24 SRTP. Approve the agency FY22 salary and wage schedule. Authorize staff to amend all necessary personnel and contractual documents affected by the adopted budget as appropriate and in accordance with agency procurement and human resources policies. Affected contracts include, but are not limited to, those for purchase transportation, uniforms, tire lease, CNG compressor maintenance, employee drug testing, and medical care. And that completes my presentation. Wow. I'm sorry if, if that was long-winded, guys.
Oh, that was um, that was really good, Charlie. Honestly, uh, it's a lot of information, and I think you did a phenomenal job organizing it and making it, you know, at least in my mind, pretty understandable. Um, I think I saw Ted. Did you have your hand up? You had a question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Matt, uh, Mr. Chairman. On this uh, budget, the the reduction in employees is just just for the fiscal year, or is that a long term reduction that you that you see? Uh, Director Hoffman, thank you for the question. Um, the good news is that we're not we're not letting anyone go with this budget, at least as currently constructed. Those positions are currently vacant, and there is no plan to fill them. Um, I can tell you that what happens in the future is really dependent on what happens with ridership and our recovery from the pandemic. Uh, so it would be difficult to answer long term at this point. So this is just for the 21-22 the fiscal year at this point is what we're addressing. We're not, those positions may come back if uh, the economy comes back or if ridership returns, correct? You are correct, sir. And, and we're also not locked in for the whole year. If things dramatically change or improve or even get worse, uh, we can always come back before the board and adjust the budget as necessary. Okay. Uh, that I mean, I think you did very well doing a 10% reduction considering yeah. everything else is going on. That, that was quite a bit. It was more than I thought. So, but good. Good job on this. Thank you. Yeah, really good job, Charlie. Um, and everyone at RTA. Are there any other questions from committee members? Thank you, Ted. Uh, Jerry. Yes, Bridget. Uh, it's kind of along the lines of Ted's, uh, and I'm glad that Charlie mentioned that, that we'll be able to uh, change quickly. So um, are we going to be polling the schools to see if they're going back to colleges, going back in August? And if so, we can then quickly change uh, to increase ridership. Because I think I understand right now it's such a hard line. We want to increase ridership, but we also don't have the capacity on the buses. You know, it's, it's so we're, we're walking this line, but then I think it's also hard to, um, for the public maybe to understand that if we just receive that big infusion of funds, but we're not back on our regular routes yet either. Yeah. Uh, good comment, Director Moore. Yes, I mean, I, I think you can appreciate that we're at one of the most uncertain times in history. Um, so we don't know, uh, but I can guarantee you staff will be ready to move quickly, uh, whatever happens. Mayor Smith, this is Larry Rubio. Can I add on to that? Absolutely, Larry. Uh, uh, I was going to say Chair Moore, Director Moore, uh, to expand upon it. We, we currently are experiencing capacity constraints in, on just a few of the routes that we operate, and we do deploy sweepers out there. One of the more difficult routes to, to deploy those sweepers is the Route 200, and that's where probably we're experiencing the most complaints. It is a handful of people on a daily basis that are impacted. We're continually monitoring that, adjusting the, the sweepers to accommodate them. But with five, six people, or even 10, it's really difficult and hard to justify sending out a new bus. The cost of that bus running on a route day in and day out is very expensive. The biggest problem we have right now are the social distancing guidelines that we have to live under with the capacity restriction of 10 in a bus that used to carry 40 seated, 60 uh, when we had standee. When that relaxes, and we hope that soon, our capacity issues won't exist. And we're gonna get back to the point where we'll have a lot of excess room, hopefully accommodate those passengers. But that seems to be the biggest obstacle we're facing right now. We hope with the governor's relaxation on June 15th, that that's gonna give us some breathing room to add people into the buses. Thank you. Good questions, very good questions. Um, Larry, I had a, just kind of what you were talking about. And I do believe that things, as we all know, is gonna change pretty significantly come June 15th. Um, it's pretty clear that uh, the governor's made it a note that besides masks, everything's gonna continue as what we used to, you know, what we're used to full capacity, movie theaters, malls, restaurants. Um, when we're looking at, you know, also being compliant with the other rules and regulations that we have to deal with in, in regards to health. What's the plan when that happens after June 15th? I know you talked a little bit about it. Um, it's still uncertain because we don't know how 
um, our riders are going to react to that new order come June 15th and the new guidelines that are going to take place. But what's what's kind of what are you guys talking about at the staff level in preparation for that? Because Bridget, you know, you brought up a great, you know, we got school coming. That's the biggest thing. School is going to be, you know, college students. So what kind of conversations are you all having at the staff level in preparation for June 15th? Well, what we've done, Chair Smith, up to now is, is we've followed strictly the CDC guidelines and any stricter guidelines that may trickle down at the state or the local level. If on June 15th all the restrictions are lifted, uh, we continue to plan and follow those guidelines, whether it's face mask requirements, hopefully social distancing is, is lifted, if not, whatever new uh, measurement that might be or, or regulation that might turn into. Our drivers are still protected uh, with barriers. The, uh, the president's mask mandate, or at least TSA's mask mandate now is extended to September. So we'll have to continue following the mask mandate. We hope our drivers choose to get vaccinated. We hope the public chooses to get vaccinated. That'll allow for another layer of protection for everybody who does receive that vaccine, although not everybody will. I expect when those guidelines are, are lifted or uh, reduced, we'll have a, an equal number of people who are upset and will want yeah. six foot social distancing guidelines. They'll want mask requirements and the, the restrictions that we have in place now. I don't know if we're going to make everybody happy, at least for a long time. Right now, about half are upset and the other half are happy. And I expect that to completely reverse when these guidelines uh, change. But it's our mandate and our requirement to continue to follow those guidelines at a staff level. We're meeting daily. We talk about it daily. Uh, we've done right now everything that we're supposed to do and then some by the standards that have been set out by the federal, state, and local governments. We'll, we'll adapt and we'll pivot to whatever new guidelines come out. Uh, I know that's not exactly what you wanted to, to hear. We don't have a precise detailed plan because we don't know yet what the governor's June 15th Mandate's gonna gonna say. Uh, I I heard that the social distancing guidelines and the mask will still be required on June 15th. Yes. I hope you're right. It's just the mask because if you still have social distancing, you can't reopen. Yeah. Uh, to the degree that you were pre-pandemic. So, long answer to your question. I'm sorry for no, that. I, no, but, I, I uh, appreciate it. Still a lot it. of unknown. Yeah, and I'm I'm sorry I'm taking time on this. The, the last question I had was is. Um, Obviously, it's a requirement to ride in our buses and have a mask. That's the requirement. Are we providing masks at entry for people that don't? No. Have? Is there, no, no, sir, we don't. Is there, um, is, is there any grant programs that are funding masks for bus agencies to be able to have masks at the entry of the bus station for people to grab if they don't have them? I don't even know if it's an issue with our riders or not. But is that even being talked about or looked at? Uh, we did discuss it internally. We met on it. We analyzed it. And we made a determination to not provide masks because we didn't know whether we'd be able to control the distribution. Uh, at the time that masks were needed or wanted, the social distancing restrictions were in place and we didn't feel safe having our bus drivers leave their, their seat or issue masks to passengers. We were boarding passengers through the rear doors so they get kept as far away from the driver as possible and we suspended fares. At the transit centers, we didn't have a, a method to control the distribution there. Talking to sister transit agencies throughout the nation, they all experienced similar difficulties. Those that had ambassadors out at transit centers were able to issue masks to passengers, customers, uh, but they were fraught with problems because arguments would begin, fights would start, uh, hoarding of masks took place. It was just something that we didn't feel we wanted to saddle our employees with at that time. Right now, the demand for masks has kind of subsided. Most everybody who wants a mask has a mask by now. Early on, you just couldn't find them. In right. fact, early on, we were told we didn't need them. CD said, don't worry about it, you don't need it. Then later we found out we did need it. And uh, this turned into a new industry. Face masks are being offered all over the internet and street corners now. So again, a long answer to your question. We, we don't distribute masks. 
We could divert some of our grant money to face masks in order to buy them. That was one of your questions as well, was grant money available? We could do that, but we would be taking that money away from other projects or, or needs within the agency if we diverted it to face masks for our customers. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. The only reason why I ask is, is one of my businesses that we own, we deal with uh, drivers that deliver packages and we just applied for a, a face, face mask grant that is only specific used to buy face masks. And um, we put masks in front of the door where they receive the packages. And I mean, you're, like, you're right, Larry, they already have their own masks, but we cover ourselves on the PR side of it, showing that, hey, we're always compliant. We're always taking care of anyone that wants to come through the door to grab the package. We have, you know, the necessary tools for them to, you know, be able to do that. So that's, that's the only reason why I ask. Um, but I appreciate you answering and I, I figured you already vetted it and um, had conversations with other agencies. Um, are there any other questions from committee members about item number eight? I have a question. Um, I was looking at our agenda and I didn't see the presentation that we saw as an attachment. I was wondering if um, we could get a copy of that. Yeah, Charlie, we'll, we'll have that? that sent out call the board. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Any questions from the public on this item? Yes, this is Keith White. Um, real quick, um, on the electronic fare boxes, the technology, as we have token transit, you know, they had a big white box. If you guys been planning to look at fare boxes, are you trying to give us that white box and try like maybe inside the box? Because like over in LA, they have what's called tap, you know, or, you know what I'm saying, a little circle on a fare box. Are you guys looking into that where cause sometimes when you use your token transit with the app on your phone, Sometimes it won't be. And I have that issue a couple of times. So that's my question with the technology on the fare box. How are you guys looking into technology for that? That's my concern. Thank you. A good question, Mr. White. I can tell you that um, we are going to look at all technology. Uh, we are interested in the latest and greatest and best, and we're going to keep an open mind uh, and go with what makes sense for our customers. So no determination has been made yet. Uh, first, we got to get it in the budget. <laughs> So it's not there yet, but uh, once it is, we'll we'll keep all options on the table. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Keith, for the question. Any other public questions? Public comments? Um, yes, Chair Smith. I did receive a request to speak um, from Stephen Ma, who has asked that his comment be read by staff. Of course. Okay. Will you please read the comment? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. RTA has to respond more quickly to ridership changes because of vaccination and recovery from COVID. The 200 should be included in the service increase, but it is not. Also, early morning trips and hourly frequencies that existed pre-pandemic should be reinstated as soon as possible. Disneyland has reopened and there are now many cross-county commuters that relied on the 200 could not get to work on time or have to wait an extra two hours after getting off work. 200 now runs every 100 minutes and it is often full. If sweeper buses are sent consistently, why can't RTA just put the bus onto the schedule and evenly distribute the headways so that commuters can plan their trips? The situation is getting so bad that there are more angry reacts than likes on the most recent service change post. Please help the cross-county commuters that have to rely on RTA for cross-county service. Um, that's an interesting, I mean, I want, if you don't mind, Larry, I just want to have an open discussion on, we've had conversations in regards to having to reduce um, different routes and it's based all on percentages, right? It's based on directly how many people, I mean, some of our, our routes are showing an 89% reduction. I know we looked at a few of them in Temecula and others, but with our cross county uh, ones as well, are we, are we, is that where we're getting our numbers from? I mean, is it showing the same of reduction or is this a valid point that we need to address? Um, the, the, the commuter links across county routes are experiencing drastic reductions as well. And to put things in perspective, capacity is 10 right now. Uh, so the, that was the route I was speaking to earlier with uh, Director Moore. The Route 200 is exactly the route that's being referenced here. 
Right. It's not quite as simple as if we put a sweeper out, just put the sweeper into the schedule and run it consistently because there are other trips that are still missing passengers. So our operations department does a really admirable job trying to track where those, those uh, passengers are being left, what location, what time, and what trip to insert a sweeper when manpower and resources are available. We still have a huge reduction in uh, human or bus drivers, human resources. Right. Because we have a lot of absenteeism still due to symptoms and COVID and related issues. We're also down to, uh, or we're imp we've implemented for sanitary reasons, one bus, one driver. So a bus isn't handed off to a driver en route. Each driver that leaves out of this division or Hemet division takes a clean, freshly sanitized bus, not just for the driver's sake, but for the passenger's sake. In September, the one bus, one driver rule will be suspended. We hope at that point the pandemic's under control. Those who want the vaccine have received it, and those who don't feel that they have uh, enough protection that they don't need it. So that'll give us a, a, a spare ratio of buses. And with the service change that's coming up to this May, next week, we'll also have a, uh, a surplus of drivers that we can start to meet these demands a little easier. So we're coming out of the pandemic as, as best we can. This happened a little faster than we thought, but we still have a capacity issue. And the perception of full a full bus right now for our customers is 10. And unfortunately, we live under those restrictions. So when we hit 11, we've exceeded capacity and we violated CDC guidelines. And that's what he's referring to. Well, it's, I mean, if Mr. Ma is listening, you know, the good news is, is that um, RTA is continuing to make strides to adapt to the current changes because I agree with you too, Larry. It's happening fast um, for you know recent things that are taking place throughout the state, and it's just it's it's good news that your guys' pulse is so strong on on you know the change that is occurring. So thank you for that. Um, is there anyone on the line that would like to make comments on this item before we uh, take it up for a motion to approve? Any other board members? Directors that want to make any comments on what we've discussed? All right, can I get a motion for approval on item number eight? Wildemar moves. Marco seconds. All right, I got I got the motion for Wildemar second from Norco. Thank yes. you. Perfect. Are there any no's? Any abstentions on this? The motion has passed. And that was, all right, so that's, yeah, that's item number eight. Uh, next is item nine, which is board member comments. And before we go into comments, I get the opportunity, thanks to our awesome staff and our chair, Krupa, for saying happy birthday to some, some of our staff members. So we're going to start doing this, saying happy birthday to uh, some of the people that we get to work with. Kristen Warinsky, happy birthday to you. Um, thank you for all that you do. We appreciate you. Um, I'm going to butcher this. Yes, Nia Felix. Did I get that right? Maybe. <laughs> then, yeah. Happy birthday to you in May as well. And of course, our fearless leader, Larry Rubio, also has a May birthday. And he's, he is turning 39. So congratulations, Larry. Happy birthday. <laughs> We appreciate you, but honestly, we appreciate the staff so much and the directors too. And I know birthdays are a special time of the year um, and it should be. So we just wanna say thank you so much. Happy, happy birthday for those of you that were born in the month of May. Um, and with that, I'm gonna go into um, board member comments. Let's start off with our chair, Linda. You got anything for us? I do, thank you very much. Uh, Jeremy, you, you run a good meeting, so thank you yeah. very much for what you do. And staff always is, is so good in their presentation, so thorough and uh, articulate in what they tell us. Uh, I do want to apologize for coming in late to the meeting. My one o'clock went late, and now I'm going to bug out because I have a treatment in about 40 minutes and I need to get in my car and on the way. But I did want to share with you all that I am doing extremely well, uh, getting a little tired, uh, and radiation will do that to you. But other than that, I am, I, I am praising God every day for the fact that I am healthy and I am beating this cancer. And I thank you all for the prayers and the support because without all of you, 
I, I, I wouldn't be as strong as I am. So thank you very much. And with that, uh, I'll see you all at the board meeting next week. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mr. Santos, my friend in Beaumont, what do we got? Good, Jeremy. Uh, nice to hear from you guys. I like uh, to, uh, you know, compliment and, and say really thank you. Uh, all of this package that I received from the, uh, you know, uh, from the uh, staff, very thorough. I mean, uh, you know, I'm amazed and, and I'm really glad uh, to be part of this, uh, you know, uh, organization and this agency. And um, I really like, uh, you know, uh, reading the, uh, this and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, dealing with you guys. Uh, good job also, uh, Jeremy. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you're doing well. And also, I uh, like uh, to share with you. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Beaumont uh, will open the uh, first theater we have the, uh, you know, uh, this coming May 15. Please uh, come by. And then uh, I'll also, I, I've seen the uh, uh, Route uh, 30 uh, servicing the uh, Sun Lake, the uh, the uh, uh, Walmart in 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 Beaumont and uh, going to uh, Hemet um, Volume uh, Mall. That's excellent. Uh, I'm so excited about that. Uh, and there's a route uh, going uh, back and forth on, on, this, uh, on this region. Other than that, thank you so much. And uh, God bless everyone. Thank, thank you, you, Ray, I appreciate you. Linda Molina, how are we doing in Calamesa? Well, Calamesa is pretty windy today and it's kind of like earthquake weather, So, but I don't want to jinx that. First off, let me wish everyone a happy Cinco de Mayo. If we were in person, we'd all be munching on Mexican bread. I'm sorry that didn't happen, but maybe later on in the year, we'll make up a celebration to have pan dulce and you'll be sure to have some. Um, staff is forever thorough in all that they do and I thank them as well. And um, I know their uh, cities are, are scurrying to get you know, up to catch up to what the county restrictions are going to be and not going to be. So I think RTA has done a fantastic job and I'm proud to be associated with RTA. So thank you, uh, Mr. Rubio and, and staff. Excellent, excellent, um, excellent job. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Mr. Sheridan over in Lake Elsinore, my next door neighbor. How are we doing, my friend? Very good, sir. How are you? Can you hear me Thanks. okay? Absolutely. We got you loud and clear. Very good. Um, I asked Joan to put up some pictures. We uh, did finally get a uh, new pad on uh, Canyon Hills or on uh, Railroad Canyon Road. And nice. uh, so we're going to show some pictures here. Um, and there's no order of the pictures, but um, essentially what happened was there was the bus stop that had a um, uh, planner in front of it. And as a result of that, folks were having a hard time uh, going over the planter to get on the bus. And finally, um, uh, this was brought to my attention by a constituent of mine uh, who lives in Canyon Hills, and uh, we got it taken care of. Uh, the pad is now up and uh, working or, you know, done, and uh, it's good. And I want to, again, say thank you to, to Jim uh, Keatonins, um for his help on this, and also the uh, Lake Elsinore uh, Public Works staff uh, for taking care of this. So with that, that's, uh, that's my, my comment. Thank you. Hey, Tim, good job on that. I know you led the effort and the, uh, it was amazing because that thing was up so quickly and there was not much traffic delay. Um, as you know, cause you drive it, it gets crazy right through there, right by the Starbucks. So awesome work, my friend. Good job. All right. Horse country, Ted Hoffman, what do we got? I don't unmute oh, myself. I, I just had to unmute. Jeremy, um, my condolences in the city of Norco to the city of Canyon Lake for the loss of council member uh, Jordan, uh, Aaron, Aaron Krantz. Uh, that was quite a shock to us yeah. uh, on, on several of us, the boards that we sit on with him. So uh, please uh, pass on that we're feeling about him and his family. So, Ted, thank you. That, that means a lot. We're still a little shocked in here. We have a council meeting tonight and uh, so we're still trying to process, but Ted, thank you. That means a lot. Uh, Wildemar, Bridget, you got anything for us? Yes, I too want to echo my thoughts. Um, quick little story. Uh, 
you know, we do raffles and stuff. And so a uh, lunch with me was one of the raffles at some event. I don't remember which one and Jordan won it. So I took him <laughs> to lunch at, then it was uh, decanters. And so we had lunch over there, but yes, I echo the sentiments. Um, I was in shock when I heard the news too. Yeah. Um, on a lighter note, I want to say happy birthday to staff and then also happy mother's day to all the mothers out there. Absolutely. Happy mother's day indeed. Um, let's see here. Uh, is it, Michelle's not here, right? So Andre? It's Andrea, hello. Andrea, there we go. Sorry, Andrea, District 3, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, no update from us, but um, I almost forgot about Mother's Day, so that was <laughs> a nice reminder. <laughs> Absolutely, see, get something good out of this, more than just numbers. <laughs> Art Welsh, District 5, besides running for governor, what do we got, my friend? <laughs> all right you're, you're you're muted you're still muted i don't know if you can hear us or not but no he can't all right you're muted i'm sorry there you go you got to start over my friend you got to start over oh yes uh the boss is running for governor uh, that was publicly announced on Friday. Yep. Uh, so he's expecting more work out of the rest of us right now. <laughs> I want to, I want, my comments was on the bus service out here in the pass area. I want to co uh, compliment Ray for his comments and second what he said. The service has just been continuously outstanding. Um, I think our, our pastors out here are feeling very good, even with the slowdown of, of routine service, but just feeling very good about the service are offered from RTA. The other thing I want to say is I compliment staff again on their presentations and their professionalism uh, of doing business uh, with, with the county and with all the constituents and with us. So thank you very much. Awesome, Art. Thank you so much for that. Um, next is uh, item 10 in regards to announcement. Mr. Rubio, do you have any announcements? I have a few, Chair Smith, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to uh, acknowledge you for lowballing my birthday at 39. I'm actually gonna be 40. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I, just uh -huh. I, just, I just know there's more discounts in life in the 30s, so I'm just trying to, trying to look out for you, Mr. Rubio. <laughs> Uh, last night, the City of Riverside Council approved the property sale to RTA for the last piece of property we needed on Vine Street to complete the uh, footprint where we're going to build the new Riverside Transit Agency Mobility Hub. So that's been a long time in the works. Uh, we appreciate the city's uh, effort in working with us and the board's patience in uh, us putting this together. So that will be moving forward at a much faster pace now. You probably received an email from me earlier this week. We partnered with the County of Riverside. We'll be having or hosting a mobile vaccination clinic here at our headquarters site, 1825 3rd Street on May 12, 13 and 14. It'll operate between the eight hours of 8.30 in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon. The vaccine will be Pfizer. It's open to anybody who wants a vac vaccination. Uh, no appointments are required. However, they're encouraged. So if you haven't been vaccinated, you know somebody who hasn't been vaccinated who wants to get vaccinated, please send them out here. We'll be happy to accommodate them and uh, get their vaccination. The second dose will be scheduled at that time. The mobile vaccine clinic will come back on June 4th to administer that. And that concludes my announcement. Happy Mother's Day to all those out there who are mothers and uh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Larry. Appreciate the, uh, the updated information. Um, all right. That leads us to anyone else got anything to say? We're good. We're, okay, good. Just want to make sure. Uh, next is um, our next meeting, which is June 2nd. Uh, and that's going to be at two o'clock Wednesday as usual. Um, I'm going to call the meeting. Uh, the May 5th to 2021 board budget and finance committee is adjourned at 2.53. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate you joining. Thank you, staff, for all the hard work on this one. I know it was a lot of information. Thank you. Good job, Thanks. everyone. Good job, Jerry.